let me take a question sir and uh, then we will also uh, open the forum one by one uh, for asking questions someone st asked about please uh, uh, tell us more about preventive part of healthcare sir okay so the, i think the preventive part of healthcare is the most exciting part that uh, i have observed in in terms of uh, trends that are shaping healthcare okay earlier it was very difficult for people to actually uh, understand what to do to prevent their health okay or so to prevent disease or to prevent illness or to keep themselves healthy so we we knew generic things like you have to eat the right sort of food you have to eat the food in the right kind of uh, quantity we shouldn't eat oily food we shouldn't eat a, a lot of uh, masala food or or whatever you know you 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 knew that you shouldn't have too much of alcohol you shouldn't smoke too much you need to exercise all these things were there but very few people could actually understand what it was what was happening to themselves so a person would actually get into a jolt he would be jolted into into a sort of a life a changing event when he would be he or she would be diagnosed with diabetes or would have a you know an a cardiac event or a, you know an anginal attack or something like that. they were lucky if they would have had an anginal attack otherwise you know most people uh, realize that they have a cardiac problem when they get their first heart attack and so those kind of things would would debilitate they can debilitate you economically it debilitates you mentally and it debilitates you uh, family wise because your family suddenly begins to worry a lot about you and then you go like you know one 180 degree from being a carefree person to somebody who's getting monitored and 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 people are not very happy with doing all these things today what has happened is because of the uh, the nature of the tools that are available to us the whole nature of the digital technology and the digital health system the health, the whole health in, uh, industry that has come up on the side is focusing a lot on making people aware about the ill effects of uh, a, a badly managed lifestyle and so therefore today you are able to understand what food will give you what calorie level okay so you can click on you can use an app a free app that will tell you that uh, these foods are uh, you know high on calorie content or low on calorie content or you should manage your your intake within this you can get a personalized data plan from from many of these uh, uh, apps or 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 companies you know they will give you a lot of information alongside uh, just the food so you are getting a lot of advice on food you are getting a lot of advice on exercise you are actually able to see what is happening when you walk so i used to i have been walking for a long part of my life because uh, you know and and uh, earlier before i had these apps on my phone i i would look at the clock okay and i would i would you know stretch myself to kind of you know complete 60 minutes Of of the walk because after twenty minutes you start to sweat and you get tired and you say okay enough now let me go home and then you look at the walk clock and you say or watch on your phone and you say oh my god this it's only twenty minutes I have a long long more lot more to walk today what is happening is every step is getting analyzed right the, they will tell you the speed with which you are walking the calories that you are burning what sort of inclination that you have got is this the right sort of exercise to do. is there a something else that you should do it'll it'll tell you a certain level of uh, or or recommend a certain plan for you a personalization etc all of this if it was done uh, for people who are young and i'm seeing a lot of youngsters you know with apple watches on their hand and and being very very conscious you walk into any gym you will see most of them are youngsters you go into uh, parks and you see a lot of the uh, people who are jogging around or walking around are youngsters so youngsters are becoming much more aware of the fact that uh they can they need to stay fit and so the prevention part is actually becoming a very large industry and and there's a huge demand for products like nutraceuticals like cosmeceuticals food supplements dietary supplements vitamins minerals and so on and so forth which is emerging as a huge opportunity where of course pharma players are are trying to look at that uh, seriously but pharma players still think that uh, medicine is their core and they haven't really looked at illness as as a possibility so you can uh, you know just to give you an example of a company that really did well on 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 the wellness part and not on the illness part is curefit and and in 4 years you know curefit got a 2 billion dollar valuation and got picked up by the tatas so you can imagine the kind of opportunity that lies in that in that sector perfect thank you thank you sir uh mr vishal has asked what are the three major changes you foresee in digital health in india by 2025 Yes. I think the biggest change is going to be the penetration of digital health as a as a lifestyle. 
you know i think may, not while a few of us know about uh, about this and we use these apps and wearables and sensors and all that i think uh, penetration is very much required it needs to go down for this the cost of the technology and the uh, and the uh, access to products need to happen in many different ways so today most of the stuff that is available uh, is available on uh, uh, in english okay and so therefore it seems to be in the domain of the of the privileged right so for for a large scale of indians to have access to this kind of digital health services and all that i think the the adoption of vernacular languages is is going to be very important for it to penetrate down uh, data plans on our phones are extremely cheap we have the lowest cost of data per mb uh, anywhere in the world so just for people of uh, for some of you who don't know uh, uh, 1 mb of data costs 26 cents in india while it costs 12 dollars in switzerland or in different parts of europe so there's that level of difference right 26 cents versus 12 dollars in the western hemisphere so data is very cheap one of the reasons why tiktok became such an important platform in uh, in india is because of that that video could be streamed on uh, on very cheap data plans so this holds true for uh, educational content alongside entertainment right so healthcare is is one of the things that help that we need to do is to create awareness to to educate people about the ill effects of a certain food product or an ill, ill effect of a certain lifestyle or something of that sort which can be used quite a bit through videos and and things like that so i think gamification is going to become very very important i think nike today has has demonstrated to us in the in globally that they are serious contenders in the patient awareness patient education space so nike is one of the greatest threats that pharma is facing in that area okay but pharma really doesn't uh, get too perturbed because you know we don't really have a lot of focus on that area we are thinking so much about the uh, so nike has created a lot of work in that area where they use games they use uh, cartoons they use different storytelling techniques or engagement techniques where consumers are engaged in uh, or they create a community where you know you you have along with four or five of your friends you can you can create a a club or a runners club or something of that sort which will uh, work very well towards preventive uh, activity so there's there's a new type of technology that will come in there's new type of languages that will be used i think there will be different kinds of tools that will get used up and i think there will be essentially uh, more and more organizations getting into the space because you know digital health has got like about uh, 50 billion dollars of funding uh which is like you know more than the indian pharmaceutical industry it's not a comparable uh, number of course because the the indian industry is 40 billion dollars in a year a mat total and uh, the 40 billion dollars or 50 billion dollars that went into digital health has gone over a decade okay but the the fact is that a large amount of private capital is flowing into this area so what we will see is more number of companies coming up with better products who understand consumer segments will probably look at how these companies will operate in micro segments you know they will they'll probably not be spread across the whole country but there'll probably be a company which will service eastern up alone okay or there may be some a company which will focus on vidarbha or certain areas where you know they have enough potential there's huge number of people and and uh, they understand that culture really well so we might see that level of micro segmentation also happening in in digital health so the future is extremely uh exciting at least for me uh, and i'm sure that many of you who follow this space will agree with me when i say this so there is another question there please throw some light some examples how digital has helped emergency medical care too and how india can provide access to emergency medical care in rural india or rural countries through a digital intervention emergency medical care okay so i think emergency medical care is probably not an area where uh, digital health will have much of an impact in the sense the from the the kind of tools and technologies that we are talking about especially the digital therapeutics or anything what emergency care can do is uh, these internet of things you know when when these tools which are bluetooth oriented and connected to your network uh, they can actually create a a warning system okay they can create a warning system for your healthcare provider for example i know that 10 years ago metronic was working with with the ford motor company 
to create a bluetooth enabled dashboard a car with a bluetooth enabled dashboard which will connect to the the glucose monitor the continuous glucose monitor cgm monitoring which uh, which metronic had as a product so every time the blood glucose levels would fall let's say a driver is you know somebody is driving on a highway and suddenly they goes into hypoglycemia right the the cgm monitor immediately understands that you have a problem and then that uh, through the bluetooth enabled dashboard it it alerts your your service provider or your healthcare professional and they probably can fly an a helicopter and you know get you picked up a medi ambulance or whatever and then they can get you uh, picked up and driven to uh, to emergency care uh, just today or yesterday i read a story where uh, you know an athlete uh, an athlete had a uh, had had got a you know got into a, a small accident by which he had got a concussion on his head and he was in the emergency room when he was in the emergency room he felt like uh, go, using the bathroom okay and he went to the bathroom and uh, didn't come back and when he was in the bathroom the he had an apple watch on his wrist and that apple watch had actually detected a fall he had lost consciousness and and he had fallen he had hit his head on the on the wash basin on the side of the washroom and he had got he had fractured his skull and all and he was knocked out he was totally unconscious and he was bleeding so he wouldn't he would probably have died in the bathroom in the emergency room if his watch had not alerted his father his father was the emergency contact and the father was then able to talk to the doctor and and kind of you know get him out very quickly so he required brain surgery and then he woke up after 4 days so there are some some applications like these where you know you can be forewarned you know if you have irregular heartbeat for example your watch can pick it up if you have uh, if you're going into a cardiac problem there's a chance that your your uh, digital tool will pick it up you know so those kind of things you know stroke uh, another very this one i think boringer does a lot of work in this area trying to understand how they can manage stroke patients and and things like that you know so there are certain uh, applications of digital health like that thank you thank you sir so this was a good example uh, in the emergency sort of scenario um, one one question which uh, overarches many question when the world is turning towards digital health what is the role of any medical representative of a pharma company <laughs> so i think there is uh, this is this is a good question and i'm sure that you know there will be a lot of people who would have had this this thinking right i think there is a clear understanding that the role of the medical representative is not to uh, manage the healthcare of a patient the role of the medical representative as we know it today is essentially to manage the information flow at the doctor level so there are two different things that are that we are talking about so digital health tools are essentially being managed by by patients where they manage their healthcare they manage their uh, their prevention they manage their lifestyles in a very individualized manner so those are some of the things that we are talking about there the four p's well, i'm looking at it from that perspective the role of the medical uh, or our field colleague in in meeting the doctors and managing the relationship between a pharma company and uh, and that key account i think that continues unabated despite the fact that digital marketing so if if by digital health you extending the logic to to talk about digital marketing and saying that you know companies can reach doctors directly they can have all these kind of interventions over the internet and there's no need for a field colleague then i don't think that's true right i think uh, the role of a field colleague becomes stays very relevant and it's not going away anywhere soon so we are not getting into a situation where we will have a digital alone outreach okay so uh, from that perspective i think these are the slightly different digital health is patient oriented and the medical reps job is basically doctor oriented right sir uh, i'll take up another question and then we will interact for a moment for a moment with the uh, dr manthan and also dr manoj who have joined us so let me take the next question so this sir generally in india a novel mo- novel molecules comes from big pharma and me too molecules are followed in india similarly do you think even in digital indian pharmaceutical industry will wait till digital success is proven by big pharma first due to their higher budgets before we barge into the unexplored territory i think this is an excellent question this is abhishek, really, really... Uh, i think abhishek has asked okay kudos to you abhishek this is an excellent question that you've asked 
uh, I think uh, one of the reasons why pharma in India has not actually picked up the whole digital component is because we have nothing to go by, right? So we are of the opinion, when I speak to people, very senior people in the industry, the first question that I'm asked is, these are all very innovative. Can you show me examples? Okay, so, you know, innovative by definition essentially means novel. Okay, and so therefore you won't have any examples. There are no, so that's why one of my favorite sentences is that digital is all about next practices. It's never about best practices. So you cannot copy, you cannot do anything because there, it's a, there's a level of personalization. There's a level where your, what you will do on digital depends entirely on how you are approaching a, a particular business problem. And, and so therefore looking at the fact that Roche has an insights program where they're working on rare diseases and getting real world evidence and creating products out of that, or they picked up a company called Flatiron, which, which has connections with every oncology health provider in America. And they're using that data to, to research novel therapies in, in cancer and all of that is meaningless to us, right? Because we're not going to do any of that. Our business models are very different. In America, uh, digital health and uh, all these things are far, far more difficult to implement because of the regulations that happen there, number one. And number two is because pharma, you know, the kind of work that pharma is doing over there is not necessarily in this area because they have very highly differentiated products. In India, the role of technology and the role of digital becomes important because we have to consider services as very important in our gamut because our products don't differentiate. When our products don't differentiate, if you have to manage a relationship with the market, then services become important. And, and therefore, digital health offers a very good area where you can actually collaborate with a digital health company or you can do something of your own or build your own digital health tool or do something like that. To just like what Lupin and uh, DRL have announced, and I'm sure a lot of other companies are also on that path. And, so, and we'll start to see those kind of announcements happening. So, you know, to be uh, a little unfair to pharma, you know, I think uh, Indian companies have unfortunately built their, their uh, competitive advantage by, by doing whatever big pharma does at a, at a reduced cost, at a, at a scale which is much larger and at a cost which is extremely efficient. So from that perspective, I think farm, Indian Pharma is very well placed to do this. But unfortunately, that, has, that is also limiting them. So whatever Big Pharma doesn't do, Indian companies really think it's not worth doing also. Right? So while if we, if we focus on the, on the kind of illnesses that we have, the kinds of problems that are unique to our country and so on and so forth, I think we will find opportunities to serve customers at a much, much uh, more valuable level than big pharma will probably do in, in their countries where, uh, you know, healthcare is one, accessible to everybody, two, almost affordable, and three, the standardization is very, is very unique. Okay, in India, none of these exist. Neither is it affordable, nor is it accessible, nor is standardization uh, existing. So from that perspective, I think there's a lot of opportunity to build our own services. One question, uh, that is what qualifications, experience, and skills that required are required to become digital marketing professional. So I think, uh, you know, what is important, and I've always held this, uh, this very contrarian opinion that digital marketing is not about digital at all. It is everything to do with marketing, right? You use, so in the, one of the things that I do in my, in my workshops is to start with giving people a pre-read of an article called you don't need a digital strategy. This was a wonderful article that came in the MIT Sloan Management Review or something like that. And, and uh, it was written, you know, uh, a few years ago. Uh, it's an eye-dropping, uh, it's a jaw-dropping moment, eye-opening moment for most participants because they've come to hear a digital marketing session and I tell them that you don't need a digital strategy. You don't need digital, you need a strategy. So everything that you do emanates from the principles of what you've been doing all this while, right? You've understood marketing, you're a marketeer, you understand strategy, you've built a brand plan, you've built everything that is required for, for managing your product in the given environment. What you need to understand is how are things changing? What can you do to, to do differently? To, so some of the applications of digital are, how can I augment my field forces effort? How can I expand my customer group? Okay, now there, is, there are certain uh, markets in, in, in the country where, you know, uh, territories are partially covered. How can I actually use digital to, to enhance my coverage over there? Or there are territories where I'm not going at all. How can I do that? 
do i think about redefining my customer okay is my customer a doctor alone or is my customer a patient a caregiver an insurance company a hospital administrator and so on and so forth and if that is the case then can i reach out to all of them given the level of uh, field force that i have so my options are i have i use my reps or i use digital okay whichever is more effective so if you think about what you want to do in your strategy then you will realize the kind of technology that you would want to actually use okay and the same uh, principle applies to do i if i understand marketing very well okay i will find the the necessary uh, things to do when i want to become a digital mar- when i want to use digital in that marketing environment okay so this is this is the uh, the opinion that i have so therefore reorienting yourself from within the same industry within the same things how can i do things better okay and and then evaluating the role of technology i think is what is required for digital marketing however there are always certain things that you can learn which are you know i see many people uh, pursuing courses in artificial intelligence and machine learning and uh, trying to understand r and python and 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 doing spss and this and that and the other it's all good to do i'm not saying you shouldn't but please try and understand how it will impact your current job how it will impact your the way that your business is currently operating if you are if you are going to become an e-commerce marketer if you are going to become an ex- expert in e-commerce it's not going to help you in the pharma marketing because you know pharma marketing is unlikely to go into e-commerce so think about it from that perspective and i think you will you will realize that you have all the skills within yourself and it is just a little bit of reorientation to understand how technology is coming in and changing the marketplace if you understand how your patients have changed or your doctors have changed reaching out to them via digital tools becomes quite easy to understand okay so i think that's uh, uh, that is my thought on on so i wouldn't recommend really doing additional courses if you have the money you can afford it you want to you ha- you have this curiosity to learn please by all means go ahead and learn learning is never a bad thing okay but if you feel that oh i have not done any course on artificial intelligence and machine learning therefore i i cannot be a digital marketer i don't think that's true at all okay so i don't know anything about about artificial learning or machine i cannot build an app i cannot build a website those are all tec- technical guys who exist on the side right so there are people who have all those skills right do you need to be a scientist to talk to your r and d people no right you you can talk the language of an r and d person as you learn on the job right you understand what you are doing is solving business problems i think that is what you should focus on and if you focus on that you keep your focus there and you try to evolve as a marketer i think digital is one part of it and you will understand that absolutely intuitively you don't have to worry about it at all right rightly said sanjeev sir it is all about your strategy and then using digital as a medium right sir then uh, sir a question which i would like an answer from you and vivek sir also because he has been quite uh, engaged in such sort of uh, sessions and it relates to h2h also how far when we were talking about applications the applications which track your uh, uh, health so how far are the these applications reliable there is a trust factor there is a lack of trust that comes in when you have a uh, 10 apps coming from 10 different companies and one app is showing some figure other app is showing some figure where the trust goes for a toss so how far these are reliable and how how are we going to solve this trust problem Vivek, sir, I need an answer from you also. Salil, sir, first from you. No, no, no. First, I think uh, yeah. the whole problem is that uh, most of the people are still skeptical about apps coming from uh, pharma, and for that, trust has to be built, in. and trust cannot be built over a uh, overnight. It has to. It will take time, and over time, when we have people like Salil Karanpur, we'll be able to. bridge that gap between trust and uh, they not trusting us over to salim <laughs> <laughs> thank you sir thank you very much for that endorsement uh, i i think uh, he you are you are absolutely right it's very difficult to to get people to trust uh, anything immediately right so if you look at the kind of uh, regulations that exist for apps okay uh, there is there is most of these things that need that that are patient focused need to go through hipa compliance right hipaa and and this is a this is an american rule but for if you want to have a company which is going to uh, make these technology products 
customer facing products globally i think hypa compliance is going to be important and so therefore what is happening is there are certain regulations that app developers and technology companies are already following uh, which is which is kind of causing them to to adhere to the uh, to the to the benefit of the uh, of the consumer i think from their own business models right it doesn't make sense for anybody to to sell you a half baked product because the whole concept of a digital health platform is for a consumer not to make a one time purchase but to be on that platform for the rest of his life and you cannot be on that platform for the rest of your life if you don't trust it so that's i think like vivek sir was saying trust has to be developed it is it is an acquired taste right you will never be able to uh, build it on the first day the second thing to understand is most of these guidances that come from these apps and digital technology platforms are directional in nature you don't need to consider it as the last decimal absolute truth patthar pe lakheer you don't have to consider it like that it has to be directional okay your your objective is to lose weight your objective is to keep your blood sugar under check your objective is to keep your hypertension under control your objective is to you know run burn calories whatever it is you are able to measure it much beyond your own estimation if you didn't have the app how would you run this you know you would you would probably like i was saying you know you look at the clock and say 20 minutes oh my god i'm so tired but then you realize that you worked out only for 20 minutes and it's not going to be any beneficial for you at all this gives you a step by step guidance so i think you know apps need to be used as as guiding tools course setting tools and and a way in which your your health is getting measured you don't have anything better there's nothing better that can help you to measure your health and and there is a very old uh, adage in ma- in management that what you cannot measure you cannot manage so if you cannot measure healthcare at all there is nothing that you can do to know whether your what you're doing is working for you or not working for you so from that perspective i think you need to understand that these are directional in nature not focus entirely on that but use that as a measuring tool to to think about uh, uh, whether you're progressing or you're not progressing and and slowly i think you know regulations will come in as this becomes mainstream the government will feel enlightened or required to kind of you know want to uh, build regulations around all of this just like you saw teleconsultation guidelines coming into india 100 years after phones came into india you know so there will be a time when uh, when society will actually push for a for a for a requirement for that and when this these technologies mainstream i think the governments or or medical associations or some of these will will work together to build out a, a a proper regulatory guideline which will help consumers to build trust actually i was going to ask the same question that you answered in the last sentence alisa because we saw news uh, where fda the authority from us it actually uh, okayed an application yeah. as a therapy so i was going to ask you do you as a health policy observer do you see such things coming in india or other countries also where the regulator takes care of the trust issues yeah yeah trust issues and uh, so, so the aspirational area for that for the service industry is where your app will get prescribed by the same doctor who prescribes a medicine also okay so either a health app or a digital platform or a program or something like that you know there are there are many companies which are vying for that level of recognition and that level of recognition will not happen unless the fda approves it or the dcgi approves it or some regulator approves it and for that regulator to approve there will be a lot of documentation a lot of detailed analysis and uh, and study which will have to be provided to the doctor so just like how drugs are approved you know it there is possibility that there may be a policy framework that will come out for the approval of all apps and digital healthcare systems also in the not too distant future there's one question i would like to ask you sir with so many apps coming in you have for uh, pharmacy you have for healthcare and you have for this and you have for that i mean uh, sometimes your phone doesn't hold so many apps yeah. so how are we really going to address this question with sir one more uh, app, for example i am prescribed 10 medicines for right. 10 different companies that means i have to install another 10 apps actually not i think i think uh, in reality there are very few apps today right which are uh, very few apps in the sense that that really makes sense right so uh, like you said you know 10 medicines with 10 different apps is is not the right way to go so this is like pharma making websites okay pharma <laughs> makes websites for every brand without knowing why they are making the website right so uh, the idea is to have a strategy what am i going to do with it so the emergence of the super app 
environments that we are seeing, the emergence of the ecosystems, is where one app is basically giving you access to all the healthcare services that you require. So over a period of time, I think that will it will kind of you know modulate into into a market that is dominated by four or five large companies, and there will be many other companies which will have super specialized uh, you know apps which are catering to niche. Like I was saying, you know there will be one person who will be catering to Eastern UP. Another company which will be catering to another micro segment, so on and so forth. So there will be space. I think India is large enough for market where uh, where hundreds and thousands of such companies can exist. And I and I really hope that there are many more that come in because you know it it actually gives choice to the consumer. And when the consumer has a choice, I think you know that is what works best for for that person. Of course, managing the market, uh, you know, the price points and everything else is left to competition. The value that is created, I think, uh, a, a app that creates value is the app that will that will get chosen by the patient. Thank you, sir. And as Vivek has pointed out, ki how many apps does a mobile phone hold? Then this is an opportunity area for a mobile company. You can easily market. It can hold hundred of apps for you, <laughs> right, sir? So uh, let me now invite one of our speakers uh, who who requested to have an interaction today, uh, Salil, sir. Uh, uh, let me invite Dr. Manoj Kumar. Uh, a, a short, in short, I'll read out. Uh, he's a senior vice president and strategic business unit head with Intas and uh, responsible for super specialty healthcare business. He has also been guest lecturer at IIM Lucknow and GIM. So over to you, uh, Dr. Manoj, please interact. Yeah, so uh, uh, Salil, uh, uh, both of us share uh, one common beginning that is Serdia Pharmaceuticals. <laughs> and uh, I was uh, very actively listening to your talk and uh, my compliments to you for, uh, you know, presenting the four Bs. Uh, very, very interesting, I must say. I was lucky enough to finish my PhD in digital marketing and, uh, you know, uh, quite a lot of things that you said uh, actually echo, uh, uh, you know, a result of my publications as well uh, because of which I got my PhD. So I must say that, uh, we echo the same concept. I really liked what you said uh, that many a times uh, digital marketing is getting confused with, uh, uh, you know, quite a lot of digitalization and uh, that we need to be an expert into digitalization, something like Python, and artificial intelligence. I think the core uh, of uh, everything is an excellent marketing strategy where one piece of it is digitalization. And uh, a very interesting uh, professor once mentioned that what happens when, you know, all of us are traveling in a ship and uh, uh, unfortunately, this, the ship actually meets the situation of Titanic. Will you be in a position to market? And that time, distillation comes to my mind very easily. Yeah. So uh, uh, one of my things that I would like to say is, uh, which Salil, you also mentioned is, I think what is important is not knowing multiple pearls uh, of your talk. What is important is out of these four Ps, what is something which we are able to, uh, you know, really put it in practice when we go for work tomorrow and, uh, you know, actually execute those small one or two things that we find it very, very useful. And uh, another interesting learning from your talk is also that we still remain, the core of our essence still is doctors or physicians. And then comes, uh, you know, a couple of other things. Uh, one thing which came from my research was that doctors have started understanding that Google is next God. And, uh, you know, there is no way that we can differentiate uh, uh, and not answer Google questions. Uh, it was very interesting observation that... Uh, 22% of the doctors actually answer Google questions with a lot of irritation. Uh, and there were around 5 to 10% of the doctors community who actually, uh, you know, started charging the patient little extra. Uh, because, you know, uh, one is I have answered a real question. Another is I have answered the Google question. Uh, you also mentioned that, uh, you know, the world is actually evolving about digital interaction. In fact, uh, March 25th last year, uh, telemedicine got approved. Mm. And uh, if pharma really needs to focus, probably they really need to understand that what would be the impact of telemedicine 
and what would be the impact of uh, uh, you know those distribution points because now the medicine is needed in every tier 3 tier 4 uh, towns actually which practically many pharma did not focus so i wanted to ask one question to you is uh, 10 years down the line where do you see uh, uh, you know the industry do you see it as typically the way pharma operates like you know lupins of the world and intas of the world and the novartis of the world or you see couple of consultants uh, typically doing uh, various companies work uh, which could be into different space you could be an expert into distillation into like you mentioned uttar pradesh and everybody getting into that kind of space so that is something which uh, i wanted to ask you so manoj thank you first of all uh, it's great to know that you and i started off from serdia and uh, you know that we share at least that part of history uh, i have interacted or followed you on linkedin for a while and i'm sure but uh, it's been it's very nice to finally meet you face to face although not in person but at least face to face so and and also thank you for the uh, for summarizing the talk very well and and for your question so i think uh, 10 years from now is going to be a very very interesting time and i I've, i've tried to kind of you know think about what's going to happen in this space 10 years from now and i think uh the way that a customer will behave 10 years down the line is what will decide what what pharma is going to do because i am not of the opinion that pharma is going to drastically change right so if pharma is going to consider its business model as making and distributing medicines that is got that is where they will focus their core on okay and and when you are a a, a manufacturer a producer and a distributor of quality medicines what you require is probably a state of the art manufacturing capability agile uh, very very uh, flexible uh, supply chain and and those kind of things now over if you look at the past 10 years and uh, where pharma has gotten not 10 maybe more maybe about 15 or 20 we were at one point of time extremely strong in the patient services part you know almost all our brands had services as a part of the product definition many brands were launched with services you know uh, amaril novo nordisk lots of other companies which actually created a lot of these services over there and over a period of time what we've seen is that we've become because of uh, perverse incentive structures or whatever have become very fo- very product focused which is okay in in the sense that it's great you know but by, where i have a problem is that we describe ourselves as very patient centric while you know we are actually very product centric and so if that product centricity continues then what we have done is we've ceded the space of patient service or patient engagement or patient uh, relationship to a to a different industry which is the digital health industry now how we are able to to work with them will will probably define how we will survive you know in the future so the what i'm seeing as a, a, a thing that is coming up is emergence of ecosystems right like reliance owning one health ecosystem tata's owning one health ecosystem the farm easy and thing i don't know how it's going to go in but uh, you'll have three four different ecosystems which are like, taking uh, which are managing the patients now these guys work very differently from us from pharma right so those these guys uh, are driven entirely by consumer acquisition and servicing and for us it is making and and providing on or distributing medicines and we try to keep our market as small and tight as possible while those guys keep on expanding so they are di- diametrically opposite positions and the consumer so that tipping point is going to arrive maybe 3 years from now 5 years from now or 10 years from now where the consumer the number of consumers that i hold will decide my bargaining power in the market and and so therefore wh- where does that leave us that basically leaves us at a, as a manufacturer and supplier of medicines to an ecosystem that's that's reaching out to maybe 40 crore people or 50 crore people or 100 crore people or something of that sort you know so uh, for for companies where differentiation does not exist you know value chain of manufacturing and and supply chain that part of the value chain becomes very important and i think then there will also be a a, a need for pharma to kind of differentiate on the product which is where you will start to look at innovation starting to happen maybe r&d i don't know if an nce or an nme will come out but we will probably have very differentiated products in biologics 
maybe we'll get into the biosimilar space maybe we'll get into those kind of things and then there's a diff- very strong area for multinationals to bring in their uh, their products why will mncs come in with their products it's largely with, at this point of time the affordability part of the market is where they are they are unable to do this and i think these ecosystems will solve that problem because platforms are essentially all about subsidizing about keeping it cheap by diluting your this one you know they get into subscription models of like a 200 rupees a month or 500 rupees a month or something like that because they have like 40 crore people right so the, when the costs fall you know the current need for a dpco probably will disappear right? those guys will the bargaining power itself will make price pretty low right and so you have to operate and that that is the time when uh, you know margins will kind of erode and and companies will probably consolidate so you know it's it's an interesting area who knows what's going to happen but if you look at the way that uh, the trends are developing you know this is this is something that i think is going to happen in the future um let me now uh, invite manas das uh, good afternoon mrs sarveen uh, like i am not the person to say that your talk was very good but it was really very much learning informative as far as i am concerned uh being a learner in this uh, task i have only two specific questions after going through the entire discussions which is very interesting number one we have been talking that going forward from 42 usb it is going to become 130 in by 2030 right that is the market size of india and out of this even currently it's 21 billion us dollars which is going to become around 70 us billion dollars the domestic marketing other than the exports and it is very specifically you have clarified that the role for us in the pharma industry is going to be the same it's not going to change much so how do you look at what is the need of the upskilling of the people those who are working in the pharma industry going forward in moving from 42 billion usd to 130 billion usd that's my first question my second question is that when i follow linkedin and various other journals not only in our country elsewhere it is being said that marketing has got nothing to do since last year april <laughs> it was supply chain it was hr it was it marketing has got to play the role now maybe post second wave or third wave elsewhere when the things are going to become now digital has improved it has improved uh, supply chain has managed quite well efficiently so what is going to be the way forward for the sales people and the marketing people because honestly if you ask me i was at the helm of the things for two major brands in the country when uh, covid set in like from 25th march 22nd march 2020 yeah believe you me when i say we were selling like as you said nutraceutical or anything the sale was never impacted except in the acute cases in chronic cases or other areas the sale was never impacted and the two brands that i was at the helm of the things were doing extremely well so these are my two questions as i said Mr Das thank you very much it's great to interact with you and uh, thank you for these two very very relevant questions i think the first question about the future of uh, the relevance of marketing is is a really really thought provoking question uh, so the upskilling part i think i'll cover that uh, together i think yes. i have again a very contrarian opinion about this and like you said you know pharma marketing had nothing to do uh, after march 2020 i think it has extended even you know prior to that so i am i am quite uh, convinced that uh, you know pharma marketing is an oxymoron so one of the reasons is that there has been you know a, a less amount of focus on uh, on brand building or on 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 the kinds of activity that pharma marketers were supposed to do and and when you interact with uh, as i'm sure you have with pmt folks across industry you know very few of them are focusing on the real role of what a marketer should do and 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 doing a lot of other activities right so there have been stories where i've heard that pmt guys are you know part of the sales closing they're they're sitting in the office till 12 13 in the night and all that i don't think that is anyway so that that aside uh, is there a need for uh, uh, for for marketing to happen in the future is is very very interesting 
is there a need for marketing definitely will the marketing organization be structured the way it currently is i don't think so yes because okay. i have yeah because i have a feeling that you know when more and more technology is entering into a particular industry what we have started to see is the very the appearance of two very characteristic uh, things one is miniaturization where products have become smaller and smaller and smaller and more powerful in nature and the other thing is decentralization so decentralization is in, in the indian context or in the pharma context i think you know currently the way that a a a ho based marketing team decides the strategy a one size fits all strategy which is which is then told to the to the sales people and then the sales people essentially either decide to implement it or then they feel that their market needs are different and therefore they do their own thing all of this is going to exacerbate in the future as as customers become more and more connected with the organization so today what is happening is the customer relationship is being led by the by the field colleague and those field colleagues are essentially moving company to company relationships are also moving away so i think organizations will use digital technology to institutionalize those relationships and when those institutionalization of that relationship happens the level of personalization the level of of uh, relevance that will have to come into the content is not going to be probably managed at the ho level it will probably have to be managed at a more decentralized level so the question is today we have an organization which is working with 3000 colleagues you know the future of the organization can be that we have 3000 collaborators working for a particular organization so three, the the power is likely to move there where those guys will decide what is best for themselves okay and they will decide how to make so then comes the question of upskilling so if if i have that much of power within my territory can a field colleague actually be upskilled to become a ceo of his market right we use these clichés very often but we've done nothing about it right we don't give them the kind of training that can make them a ceo but entrepreneurial sort of things are likely to happen and and people are expected to become uh, very good at their own for example can i have five people who have excellent hold over the distribution in the marathwada region okay and and they could be not my employees but they may be running their own companies and who will collaborate with me to ensure that my product goes there so the kind of skills that i will be requiring will be how do i manage content to lead the relationship with my hcp or whoever my doc, my uh, customer may be i may not the hcp may not be my uh, my customer at that point of time it could probably be the the healthcare administrator of the ecosystem who owns these doctors okay so those guys whoever is my customer can i can i keep those relationships can i manage those relationships through personalized content so i need content abilities the second thing is i need analytics because data is going to be streaming if the if the relationship is going to be led by technology and when data starts to come in if i don't have the uh, ability to analyze that information i can make no use of it at all which is today the state of a, of a centralized product management team which barely gets the time to analyze data the third thing is i need to have a project management kind of a an outlook okay rather than struggling to manage 100 people or 150 doctors or something like that i will have a whole host of different stakeholders to manage okay insurance companies healthcare administrators purchase managers institutional people uh digital health coordinators patient concierges you know who knows what sort of roles will exist in the future so i am today my only uh, response or the only thing that i know to do is to say doctor please prescribe okay so that is going to go away it's going to become irrelevant so how will i how will i deal with with very very uh, many many uh, varied stakeholders who have different requirements who have different skill sets who have different require you know uh, focuses and so on and so forth is is probably the way that uh, and this cannot be this can never happen in a centralized control and command mechanism it will always have to be decentralized i think the role at the top will be that the organization will become very lean will develop very highly specialized uh, skill sets and those guys will essentially be overseeing the whole operation rather than actually having an active role to play in it so that's this is where i went a little alvin toffler for you thank you thank you very much you, <laughs> you. it's very clear uh, the next question comes and uh, this is asked uh, by ranjan 
when the person comes to a physician with his vitals known the do it why uh, yourself thing like your own watch the physician doesn't value it mm. and ask to repeat the test in his clinic then how digital will move ahead in healthcare to complement the physician yeah yeah so the again this is this has got everything to do with the current structure of the market okay the structure of the market is such that doctors are either individual practitioners who sometimes are under the influence or in partnership with diagnostic labs or they simply are not trust trusting enough of uh, you know uh, of a laboratory from where you may have got the the test done because it's the cheapest laboratory in your neighborhood right and so therefore the standardization of those techniques are probably something that the doctor doesn't trust so as a private practitioner his his most important thing will be to make sure that he gets trustworthy test results and so therefore he may get you to repeat it in a in a hospital obviously they trust their own standardized laboratories and all of that and so therefore you know the same thing will happen i think from in the future if this is you know uh, the the rise of the ecosystems right so today if you see tata okay tata has or or pharmacy let's take pharmacy or something like that right pharmacy has acquired thyrocare now thyrocare was not considered to be one of the best laboratories in the country okay and we've tried you know doing a lot of uh, thyrocare programs with doctors and all that and we got this feedback from doctors that they don't really trust a lot of the thyrocare testing okay so uh when thyrocare becomes a part of pharmacy and then pharmacy also has some other doctors and then they also have another you know all the other insurance companies all these stakeholders will the insurance company that is collaborated with uh, with pharmacy say that i don't trust thyrocare results or will the doctors who are a part of the hospital on the on the pharmacy platform will they say that we don't uh, we don't trust our own company's diagnostics so you know what will happen is that these uh, these ecosystems which i said again i at the cost of repetition the whole idea of getting these ecosystems is going to be about customer acquisition L- who controls the largest number of people on that platform becomes the most successful and the only way that you can do that is by building trust by building a standardized protocol by improving quality of services dropping price okay and and through how do they drop price they drop price because they have many 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 people who will be paying for that service and you get them onto a subscription model or you you get a little fee for something and so therefore costs get diluted over a much larger consumer base than a hospital can have at this point of time which is why they keep the prices high right so when prices fall standardization of techniques happen the the focus or the incentive of that organization is to be able to give the best service possible to their customers and they own all the different aspects of of uh, or all the different stakeholders in health you know it's going to be a completely different ball game right so today what is happening is the the lab operates on its own the doctor operates on its own the pharma operates on its own everybody operates on its own and so therefore the level of trust that is required across the whole chain is probably does not exist and and it's easy for somebody to say no 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 i don't trust them but if i am going to own the same peat as part of my own company then you know i will i will drive up the quality and at the same time build trust on that uh, on those things so going into the future i don't think these kind of objections are going to come from doctors saying that you know I, you've got yourself tested in a laboratory which i don't trust because all the services are going to be offered by the same company thank you thank you sir you said this was an a very apt example when you said tarakir uh, being a part of pharmacy and uh, it it seems to be the future where this ecosystem develops and trust has to be there otherwise how will this operate